you, Christian. <coughs> Thank you, dear audience, for staying alert for eight hours. The bar will soon be open, and I am the dangerously thin veneer between a thirsty audience and that bar. <laughs> So I'm, I'm humbled, I'm humbled by all the talks that I've heard today. It's been hard for me to concentrate on, on, on really on my talk with all these talks distracting and being so fantastic and they're a very hard act to follow. They've been humbling, they've been sobering and I, I have learned something today and I have modified my talk because of you, so thank you for that. I am, I'm talking on behalf of a team of professional choice architects. Paul, are you in the room? Do you mind if I call you a professional choice architect? I thought that was the best way to describe these four excellent people. They all probably don't need a lot of introduction, but Paul is, is our chief deep involvement in RAP. Uh, Marion Sibapala has been worked, working with Paul for a long time, risk analyst with Oricon, uh, his boss, Stuart Cassie, uh, program advisory, decision thinker, deep decision thinker. And then Ross Wise, sort of the, the guru of adaptation pathways. Uh, he's an economist, he doesn't want to be summed up as an economist, he's much, much more than that. He's also an adaptation thinker. I'm very honored to be part of that team. We, uh, we form part of the values team of RAP, but also part of the cost benefit analysis team. And we're here with with two very simple things. The first is a case, and the case is no all options. We've heard about options today, and these are options for reef restoration and adaptation, but they're also more than that. When I say all, option, all options, I really mean everything. So what we can do, what we maybe shouldn't do, and the things that we haven't thought about that we perhaps also should start thinking about. It'll be clearer when we get there. Secondly, and this is this is what Paul suggested to me, really is is probably the most important part of this talk, and that's our appeal. We haven't spoken a lot about that today, but it, it is coming out of the woodworks and it's becoming more and more clear that we need to coordinate actions. When we do make choices, we need to coordinate. There is a sense of fever, there is a sense of, after David's talk, I felt that I was on, at the edge of my seat and I was thinking, wow, we must do something. The window opportunity is closing, wow, we must go out and do something. That, that's a dangerous space to be in where we just need to do something. We need to do something, but we need to do it right. Because otherwise we are just doing something for the sake of us, not for the sake of the purpose. But the tricky part is knowing your options, coordinate your actions, them quickly. Because the storm is coming, David Wackenfeld this morning painted this picture very, very clear for us. Maybe the storm is already here. People are feeling it, the reef is feeling it, economies are feeling it. And what if, what if that storm, what if climate change really is too hard for us to fix with adaptation and restoration? I hate to, I hate to bring that up as one option, but that is a possibility. What if we are doomed to fail just looking at reef restoration and adaptation? I don't think we are, but what if we are? Then we need to entertain the options of doing nothing. Maybe the success is doing nothing and spending our money and our energy and our talents somewhere else. It is an option we cannot dismiss. What if we do something and we do it right? What if we nail it? What if, and, and rap being, might be part of that something, where this slide sort of captures just a, a, a small section of David's ingenious options that are on the table, which is just part of the concept phase, where we could cool water, we can, we can brighten clouds, we can do assisted evolution, assisted gene flow, we can entertain every different option, we can combine them, and we can then look at that maybe, and as the program and as other programs and our partnerships evolve, we can start maybe homing in on, on some of the things that really work. If we nail that, what does the reward look like? Does it, does it mean that we preserve the biodiversity on the reef? And to what extent, what does success look like? We, do, we, do we 
basically preserve fisheries values, tourism values, and, and this is just a myopic view of the values that, that could be on the table. Indigenous values, existence values. What about option values? We're often not thinking about option values for the future. What if the reef, the Great Barrier Reef, is the only reef standing in 50 years' time? And our great my grandkids say, you know, you, you failed to preserve what was the greatest option to fix food security. You didn't do the right things and now we don't have it. Um, that's a possibility. So all options need to include values we haven't even thought about yet. Or what if we fail? What if, what if the result is something like this? What would the consequences of that be for people and for values and so on? We've all been there. We've all been there with doing something wrong. What about, you know, you, you pick the wrong shares, wrong superannuation fund, you didn't propose to the love of your life when you had the chance and the window closed and she ended up having whatever. <laughs> it's a sad story, I don't even want to think about it. You know, let's go to the bar. Um, <laughs> but it's possible, right? We could do something, we can just, just, just fail. In that sense, because we're not fast enough, we don't act when we have the opportunity. So I wanted to explore these three categories of choices with you a little bit. I want to do it with a bit of data. And Paul and the team and I have been thinking about some of these different options quite hard because I do think they have to be at the front of this conversation and I like to bring that back whenever we have these discussions. So we did a little, little bit of a case study here where we looked at some, uh, some of the reefs off Cairns here and looked at some of the recent results coming out of the RAP program, which has some, some modeling predictions of how the reefs out there might fare under different climate change scenarios, under some different interventions, and we might also look at the values, the different consequences of if we do things right versus do things wrong. So bear with me, I'm just gonna give you one minute of technical details in terms of what underlie that study. So 150 reefs that we modeled um, in terms of different futures and interventions, but then we also developed a reef condition index that basically used coral cover as one metric, and we said that combined with the quality of that cover, is it good quality, is it good for fish, is it good for biodiversity, and we combined that into a reef condition index. Very simplistic, but it does capture some of the values including um, biodiversity and basically reef real estate. So we basically mapped the quality of the reef real estate for the purpose of this exercise. We then took that reef real estate map and we combined that with some literature data on the values of ecosystem services. And, and, and one source there is the United Nations that looked at a number of different values. You could actually monetize. You could put money, you could put money value on them. They become ridiculous when we start thinking about future values and you think about existence values, biodiversity, indigenous uh, values, and I apologize for that, for that myopia. But if you were to put money values on these, they range from about 115,000 to about $1.2 million, depending on where in the world you are. Hawaiian reefs are, are intensely, intensely used and valued, so they would be on the higher range. What we did for the purpose of this exercise was choose a much more sort of conservative recent estimate by Costanza at $350,000 per hectare per year. Now that's a conservative estimate, we're going to get back to why that is. First result slide. This shows the expected reef condition index between now and 2075 if we do nothing in terms of reef restoration and adaptation, but we nail costs, Sheridan. This is costs nailed, and it is water quality fixed. So what it shows is that we start with a relatively low base of 40% of the reef off cans being in good condition. By 2050, they would have shrunk to half even under this situation where we do nothing but have done everything we can in conventional management. And by 2075, they're down about 10%. That's under good climate change, moderate climate change. This is now under severe climate change. By 2050, we almost run out of good reefs. And here, good reefs are quite modest. They're 30% of their maximum condition index. 
These are the counterfactuals that we use in RAP. This is the basis we use in RAP to say, should we do nothing? Should we just accept this? Or should we go forward and entertain a number of options? So let's use this and go forward. This panel shows almost the same as before, the blue line and on the left axis are basically with condition index over time. And the red area and the red line shows the, your projection of ecosystem values using Constanza's measure scaled with reef condition. Then we have applied a pretty aggressive discount rate of about 3.5%. And then we sum that up under that curve and take it till today and say, what would the reef be worth integrated over all these ecosystems? So, so the present value, the gross present value of the reef today, on the moderate climate change, if we did nothing, fixed costs, fixed water quality, about $160 billion. Just go let that resonate in the room for about three seconds. If we did nothing, fixed water, fixed water quality, fixed costs, but climate change uglier and we had 8.5 rolling out, we'd, we'd lose about $30 billion just, just in that scenario. If we then said, let's, let's, let's look at the success, let's say we do something. We haven't plugged interventions into it. We just said, what if we do something? And that something stabilizes the reef condition now. We come to terms with a low base, but we stabilize that. And we take it into the future and we look at the present value of that. We gain about 20 billion. What if we do, and this is me verbatim going into the Reef 2050 plan and saying, what if we do what the Reef 2050 plan is is hoping, aspiring, almost promising to do. The reef condition gets better decade by decade. That's the right panel. And then we look at the, the present value, we calculate the present value of that. $3.1 billion. But hang on, this is only for the Cairns reefs. We then looked at the difference between those counterfactuals, because we said, let's just, let's just say we're gonna do something the counterfactuals of no wrap. Then we look at the changes, the gains in those values if we prevent further decline under a moderate climate scenario. The gain is $20 billion right there for the Cairns reefs. The number in brackets is me multiplying it by eight to taking it up to the whole barrier reef. Or we can improve decade by decade and do what the Reef 2050 plan would have us do. The difference between doing it right and not doing anything could be $1.2 trillion into the future. <coughs> under, under, under worst case climate change, yes, it looks worse. We would have to do much better. We'd have to work much harder to achieve that same goal. Now this is the talk about options. And you may say this is a motherhood statement. Of, of course we need to know our options. And, and the word wicked has been mentioned twice today. This is wicked and curly and very difficult. It is harder than, than anything that I've ever come up against in terms of a decision choice. Like picking the right house for a family that can't agree on anything. You know, this is, this is nothing, you know, that's nothing compared. I want to give you a little bit of a taste of what I mean when I, when I talk about the different options and why that is wicked. What I'm showing you here is a little decision tree. It's very simple. And it's, it's looking at, say, say we're betting on, on Paris. We, we're optimistic. We're all smiling. We're optimistic. And we're saying, let's bet on Paris. And let's say we get 1.5 degrees. We look for ecological interventions, biological interventions. One to in. You can... That can be 100, in can be 100, it can be 10, it can be 5. Then there are engineering strategies we can do. That's another layer of intervention <coughs> options we need to think about. Then there's adaptation. What if we come up with a solution, ecologically, biological, that people don't accept or can't live with them, wouldn't know what to do with, we're gonna plug it into an adaptation strategy. For every layer we add there, there might be 10 different options. So that's very quickly a thousand different options that we have to systematically interrogate. 
to say that we've looked at all options. Right? And what if we early on say, oh, there's fever, we must do something. Someone has a great idea, it's shiny, it's compelling, and it gets funding. And that, that rolls out. And in five years' time, we realize that we've been following the red arrow because we think that is, we did something and that we've committed and now we need to commit more. And we end up with a suboptimal option. Maybe the benefit, the one plus in the, in the yellow box, is, is if we flatlined if we just prevented loss after 2050. Where in fact, if we had been a bit more open-minded, interrogated harder, and really had known our choices, we would have followed the green path, and we would have ended up with achieving the Reef 2050 goal. Not by hesitating, but by thinking hard about our choices, understanding them. And then, of course, the orange boxes in between other dangerous places where we just, we just fail. Now that's... That's if it was good, warm climate change. What if it's really bad climate change? That means that we maybe have to look at different options. That, 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 that will be solutions under the warmer climate. I want to end on our appeal. And this is Paul's and David's slide. And when I thought about coordination, this really rang, rang true to me. It's inspired by the Sokolov's wedges and really what it means is you need to stack your interventions you need to once you have your options in the different categories you need to think about stacking them queuing them and building on it's a bit like a you know passing a baton to other players and you've done your part of the game you pass it on and so on and in that way you can basically build a bridge into the future precise more decline this decline here is very steep and that takes us back to David's talk that if we don't get if we don't make that slope as you know, not as steep, make it less steep, then we have a better chance of stacking up these different solutions in such a way we can actually achieve success. I'm going to stop there. Thank you.